Hello, welcome to today's AMA. My name is Robin Leonard. I'm the host. I'm joined today by a very special guest, Robert Lopez, who is the GM of Brand, Customer Experience and Innovation at Norse Collective. Happy to have you on the show today, Robert. Thanks so much for having me, Robin. Great to be here. How was your Dreamforce experience? What a whirlwind. We will give you a pre-warning and a preemptive sort of conversation before you head over there. But let me tell you, it is a full on three day experience and you really need a week off afterwards just to recover from it. But what a great networking opportunity and educational opportunity that was. Any tips for first timers at Dreamforce? Wear comfortable shoes. Don't overcommit. When you build your agenda for the three days, try not to fit too much into one day because you don't quite understand until you get there how big this thing really is and how distanced a lot of the sessions are and how long it'll take you to get between them. And the keynotes especially, if you're wanting to attend any of the keynote or guest speakers, make sure you get there early, probably 60 to 90 minutes worth of queuing for those ones, but plan your time effectively. And don't be scared to network. Meet people, talk to people. I've got three pages worth of new contacts from my time over at Dreamforce. And a lot of them I'm still regularly in touch with as well on a number of projects. So really good networking experience and take a lot of weight. Bring stuff back with you. Bring stuff that you know your organization will benefit from. Yeah, that's very good advice. And uh, yes, the shoes thing is <laughs> definitely something that's important. My lesson was don't wear new shoes, even if they look comfortable. What were your top key takeaways from Dreamforce? Yeah, I think the first one was back up your system. We've been very big on backing up our data here at Norse Collective but I never really looked at system backup and our actual Salesforce instance that we've invested a lot of resources, money and time into building. So it's really important to have a plan of attack to back up your actual sales environment and ecosystem because it took a lot of effort to build that out. So that was the first thing I brought back. And since then, we've actually implemented a backup of our Salesforce system, which has been great. Another takeaway I had was around the sustainability piece. It was such a hot topic this year's Dreamforce. So I think it's something that organizations really need to be focused on. It's a global topic, not just a local topic. And I think organizations need to be on the front foot with that one. Personalization from the marketing landscape, personalization was another really hot topic and everybody's mouth over there. I presented two sessions on personalization over at Dreamforce this year. And it's just so important that companies have a strong sort of first party data led personalization strategy. So it was great to come back knowing that's the journey we're on and we've been on. How do you justify costs to stakeholders? That's an important question, that one. You've got to be open and honest from the get go. You can't go into this thinking that cutting corners, cutting costs is going to be an effective way to manage this project. You've got to be honest with yourself and honest with your stakeholders. You've really got to keep them on that journey with you the whole way through, celebrating the wins, but also making them aware of the challenges that you overcome. When it comes to the cost side of it, working closely with your partners is a big part of it and closely with your Salesforce team as well, making sure that you budget effectively. And when I'm always in conversations with our CEO and our CFO, always talking about any project changes, any additions to the projects, any savings we make as well. The CFO always likes to hear about a saving. But for me, it's all about what results are we driving? How are we hitting our objectives through this spend? And what does the ROI look like? Which in marketing land can be a little tricky sometimes to really delve into the ROI. What's the return on your marketing spend? What's your return on your advertising spend? But you've got to really build some stringent rules and structures and objectives around your spend so that you've got something tangible that you can deliver back to your key stakeholders. There's always going to be those that don't like change. One thing I said from the beginning to our CEO was this journey is going to affect everybody. Whether you're the CEO, whether you're a general manager of one of our venues, whether you're a reception team member, everybody is going to be affected by this digital transformation journey. So it was important that from the get-go, we built project groups and we started breaking up the overall digital transformation project into smaller sub-projects. And we got key advocates within each of those groups that then spoke with their team members and mm. kept them on board and kept them understanding where the project was going, but what the objectives were, what was the final state going to look like? How is this going to, in turn, enhance our business operations, enhance our customer experience and enhance their day-to-day -day work as well and really keep them aboard all of the wins that we were going to achieve at the end of it. There's an end goal to this. Yes, there's a lot of work now. 
but there's an end goal down the track that we're going to be realizing and we're realizing that now that's where we're at and really we don't have anybody that is against the change now because they've seen the hard benefits of what we've done that's incredible it's a good story because you've got the telstras and the anz's of the world that they throw a lot of money at this technology transformation but it's impressive to see an organization that's not necessarily got all of their money to be bold enough to make this investment. The people making the investment are people. That stakeholder justification is so critical. It's quite astounding how we've seen a business like North Collective really adopt Salesforce. Tell us, where are you up to in your Salesforce journey? We turned the lights on in August of 2020. We've got Service Cloud acting as our CRM, we've got Marketing Cloud, and we've got Tableau CRM Analytics. So we've got this first-party data-led ecosystem. We've got a lot of integrations. A lot of our disparate siloed systems are integrated with our CRM, with Salesforce. Current state is that we're really focused now on driving that ROI piece and really building out some robust reporting tools and systems that allow us to show the effectiveness of our implementation. We've got some future integrations still to do around the analytics and marketing space that are going to help build this single source of customer truth. But in terms of where we are now, we've integrated, we've been in place since August of 2020, and now we're really refining, retuning, and just continuing to build out reporting structures. You're implementing across multiple businesses. It's also the club structure. It's a set of businesses within a business. So often a club is like a venue for events it it has ticketing it has food and beverage it has an element of gaming but it has sometimes a sports element it has sometimes a gym element it's all sorts of micro businesses within the club and you've not only got that complexity you've actually got multiple clubs within north's collective it's a group of clubs yeah 100 percent. so we've currently got seven hospitality venues within north collective and two fitness centers and it's growing at a rapid pace for North Collective. We onboarded three new hospitality venues in the last 10 months, which has been a full-on project. But to be honest, the scalability of that has been allowed from a, an IT and infrastructure perspective because of how we've built out our Salesforce instance. Because we planned effectively initially and built the structures out in such a way that when we were bringing in new venues, it was very easy to slot them into the ecosystem. A lot of templated work was done in the early days to really allow for that to take place moving forward. But you're right, it is multifaceted. We've got over 60,000 members of North Collective and we really focus heavily on a personalization strategy and how we can ensure that we're remaining relevant to all of those members who might come and see us for different reasons, whether it's a gym visit, whether it's coming for a live show, a comedy night, a trivia night, whether they come for a meal with a family, we need to understand what their needs and wants are. And that's where we're really mm. focused. Everyone that knows Salesforce and has done any kind of project with Salesforce knows that having a CRM with a middleware platform and a marketing automation platform for multi-brands and multiple use cases, like everyone knows that's not a small feat. What were the key problems you were trying to solve? From the get-go, we set out three key objectives, and that was what was going to underpin this entire digital transformation. The first was getting a 360-degree view of a customer. Now, as you mentioned before, multiple hospitality venues within our group, multiple systems, all of them quite siloed and disparate. So to be able to obtain a single view of a customer was very difficult. You'd have to dive into so many different systems, do a lot of merging and mapping. So the first real sort of problem we were trying to solve was how do we get a single view of a customer, a single view of a member? The second objective we were trying to hit was how do we get smarter with our data? We're very data rich when it comes to demographical and transactional data. Members have membership cards, they swipe it at a point of sale. We know that Joe Smith purchased a burger at this time in this day. But how do we make sense of all this data? How do we bring it into a single centralized platform so that we can make smarter business decisions from this data? So our second objective was really bringing in an analytics tool that could allow us to use this centralized data. And then similar to that, our third objective was from a marketing lens. How do we create hyper-personalized omni-channel marketing journeys for our members using this centralized data? Our three problems we were trying to solve were those around the view of a customer, improving our business analytics, getting smarter with our data, and getting stronger with a hyper-personalized omni-channel marketing approach. Because you've done that, you are now able to scale the business. So as you mentioned, you've acquired new clubs and you're able to reuse the templated solution to do that. So it's actually enabling growth by having this platform. Yeah, 100%. We can grow it at such a rapid pace now. That trajectory we've been on has been a very steep one with our digital transformation. We've grown 
very quickly in a short period of time. That is what limits businesses a lot of the time is not being able to scale because you've got people doing needless work that a system could be doing. The people internally, those people that were administering the club memberships now they can scale and grow and support multiple clubs and being successful and as everyone knows clubs have had a very hard time during covid and it's great to see that through all of that drama they're really growing and scaling and this has been salesforce has been such a cool part of that yeah definitely it's allowed us to grow at that mm. pace really. yeah it's great but not everyone does it as well as you do like it can be challenging how did you define a plan this was new to us this was new to me i was moving from a marketing comms manager role into the role that i'm in now so this digital transformation piece i was on this learning journey as well for us it was about really relying heavily on our partners and our salesforce team to help us build out a plan of attack and an approach to our digital transformation the Stakeholders are internally for us, but they're also external stakeholders. Like AF Digital, we've got our partner ecosystem and we rely on our partners to give us advice and guidance when it comes to planning and getting a plan in action as well. So initially we worked heavily with all of our partners as a group because partner interdependencies is important too. They need to work together to build this ecosystem. And so we built out our plan and our three and four year action plan out with our partners and we worked heavily with them to get that plan onto paper and then into action. It's not like one and done, right? You've constantly got a plan and there's new things happening. Can you tell us a bit about what some of those things are? Yeah, definitely. We're looking to launch our Norse Collective app. It's been a two year project built through Heroku. So it's integrated directly with our Salesforce CRM data and it'll become another tool within Marketing Cloud. So we're building it out in Marketing Cloud as well. And I think for us, as we move into 2023, we've just finalized our 2023 plan. It's a heavy on our app implementation but also on our ROI project and building out this robust reporting structure because we've got to start really justifying spend. We've done it along the way and we've built little reports along the way, but now it's about how do I, at a click of a button, have a look at what in the last month the ROI has been from our Salesforce instance. Again, working strongly with our partners and we've started some conversations already. We've got Datarama within our marketing cloud ecosystem. We've got Tableau CRM Analytics, but really it's about using a full closed loop view of a customer. We've got the data. We understand when we're communicating our members. We understand when they're transacting with us. How do we connect the two? How do we look at it now and say, on this timeline, we actually in the last four days communicated twice with this member and we got an extra visit from that member mm -hmm. through the communication. So now it's about connecting marketing cloud with transactional data and actually looking at communication going out, what is that doing from transactions coming in? And how is how are they interdependent? And how are we changing habit? How are we getting one extra dinner visit from a family a week or even a month than we were getting a year ago? It's coming on to two years since we started that with our app partner, started that, that construction and, and development phase. And we made a decision initially not to rush it. That was the first thing. We thought you can build an app and we can get it to market maybe in six months. But that would probably be more of just a regurgitation of our websites. And this app needed to be more than just our websites in an app. It has to have the smarts and capabilities to do a lot more than just display website information. So that two years, and we've actually phased it out in three phases to make the work more palatable along the way as well. So we had three key phases and we're towards the back end of phase three now. And within those phases, we had key integrations taking place. So we worked through it during the whatever it was, five, six month lockdown last year, we kept the app project going, which gave us some time to really work on those integrations. So I think for us, it was all about getting it out in chunks, getting these phases established so that it was more palatable for key stakeholders internally, and then really understanding what we wanted to get out of the app because it's mm. just the numbers. The look and feel and design has changed as we've grown in those two years as well. And features have changed too. So I think with the app, you've always got a plan that it's not going to look the same in two years as it does now. So build it out in such a way that will allow you to adapt and change and grow over time. Yeah, that's great. It just shows a lot of tenacity to go through all of these big transformation programs. I think large businesses, small businesses, everyone struggles with these things. So actually getting through them is the hardest part, but there's so much value in doing them and leaning into them. How did you choose your partners? Yeah, it was like a, it was like a going on a dating show. Yeah, no, it was a, a fun little process actually. It all starts with Salesforce and they really want to learn and understand your business, yeah? So 
That's the first thing. We went with Salesforce because they align with who we are, what we stand for. We're a community-focused organization. So our core values align very strongly with Salesforce. When they understood our business, they then put forward their recommended partners. And then we started working with those recommended partners to understand, well, who aligns most with our values and who truly understands our business, what we do, our customers and what we stand for. Back in 2019, when we were going through this process, we landed on our core partner, we landed on our marketing cloud partner, AF Digital. Yes, they've been there since day one. For us, it was all about really that alignment piece. Who aligns best with us and our organization and our values? And who truly understands what we do? Because I'm sure there's partners out there that take on clients, but they never truly understand at the core what the client does, what the customer experience is. They just look at the technical side. Let's connect this system with this system. Let's get them talking. Why? It's always the why that people struggle to answer. Why do we need these to talk? What's the outcome of this system talking to this system that's going to benefit the organization and the customer experience at the end of the day? So for us, it was really about understanding the values of our partners and how they understand and see our business and our customers. Thank you for choosing us and thank you for continuing to work with us. It's been a real pleasure, our partnership. And sometimes it can be hard, these things, but it makes it a lot easier when you've got enjoyable people to work with. So thank you. Thank you to you and your team. It's great. How did you define and track objectives for the Salesforce investment? We broke this up into two cost centers. We have what we call our WIP or construction costs, our true building costs. And then we have our ongoing sort of managed services licensing and whatnot. So when we start talking about that initial cost, that build out cost, we really, again, worked in phases in our Salesforce build out, like we've done with the app. And we had key milestones and kept all the stakeholders, CEO, CFO, board of directors on track with those and understand if those dates shifted or changed. And the objectives that I laid out before, our three key objectives, underpinned everything. So all of our projects that we were doing, we always related them back to at least one, sometimes objectives of those three objectives. So every project or every little project that we did along the way, every little integration, every build out, on our project plan, we bought in an objective. And we said, well, what objective is this gonna try to achieve? And it could have been that full view of a customer. We're integrating our POS system because we want a full view of a customer. It's gonna take eight weeks. This is the investment it's gonna require. This is the testing period and we're going live on this date. As long as we could justify with tangible results and then it was future. What's it going to give us in one year time, one year's time? We're bringing on three venues in 10 months, which we didn't know about when we started this journey. We've got the ability in, it took us about two weeks to onboard our last two because that pause integration was so rigid and strong through a middleware layer that we could just get that pause data integrated for our new venues very easily. So we always look ahead. There's, yes, there's the now but there's also the then, what's going to happen then? What is this doing for us in the future? And that was a big part of all of our projects. We always look at what it's going to give us the ability to achieve down. You have to look for the MVPs, like you have to chunk it up. And it's like you tackle any big thing, right? You chunk it up into the smallest possible parts and just try to get some quick wins. You've taken that approach, not only with the app, but also with Salesforce, everything you're doing, you're chunking it up, you've got this bigger objective and everything you do has to track back to that. Otherwise, why are we doing it? That's probably the hardest thing with digital transformation is actually getting your head around the change and being aware of the reality of it. Like Robert, you could have started and been like, I reckon we can get this all done in a year. You could have started and thought it was possible and then been disappointed, had the stakeholders disappointed, etc. And through that, you haven't made any of not that I've seen any major mistakes or failures. And therefore, there's continued investment in the transformation, which is allowing the business to scale. And it all starts with just chunking it up and making it easy for yourself. It's got to be realistic. There's no point trying to over promise and under deliver. It just doesn't work. So right from the get go, when I sat down with CEO Luke and went through this vision, the whole way through, I was really pushing for the fact that this isn't a rush job. Mind you, it has happened quickly. We did start the building 2019 in June and where we are now, people look at it going, wow, that's just mm. what a lot of pandemic in the middle of it all. And that was an interesting one, really going through that and continuing the build out during that phase as well. 
But I was big on making sure that right from the beginning, there was a realistic time frame and timeline given and all stakeholders were across that. It's like the old joke. Did you hear about the digital transformation strategy a project that came in on time and under budget? Neither have I. Nothing's perfect. And you can't sit there saying it's going to cost this exactly. It's going to take exactly this amount of time and it's going to just go smoothly because it, do it doesn't. You overcome those because you've selected the right partners. Your Salesforce team are supporting you through these challenges and you overcome these obstacles or these change requests as well. We've had a few change requests because things have to be able to pivot. We've got to be agile in nature when you work on a project like this one. Those organizations that are struggling through their digital transformation, the silver lining is that as you do it and you overcome it, it gets easier as what you alluded to before is it's now taking us two weeks to do a new club integration because we've already done it a million times and it works. A lot of other organizations struggle through digital transformation. It's a nightmare. You've got people coming and going. It can be traumatic for the people that go through it, but it's really good to see that you're just doing it. It's good vibes. We're pushing through and you don't know what you don't know. That's the truth. We rely on our partners because they know, yeah, AFD, no Salesforce, no marketing cloud. So we rely on that partner to help us achieve what we want to. We can go out and learn and we continue to learn every day. Trailhead, trail mixes, all that stuff. But in the end, you've got the experts. They know what they do daily. So use them. How did you deal with stakeholder change management? Right from the beginning, when we actually just started breaking ground with this project, I put together a vision. And this vision was our digital transformation vision. And I'll quickly read it out. It's only it's not too long. It's to be a true leader in digital transformation using new emerging and sustainable technologies as a means to tell our story, build our brand and enrich relationships within our communities. And I built that way back in 2019 because I knew I needed to start somewhere with a vision that I could take to the people, that I could take to our stakeholders and take them on the journey right from the beginning, understanding what we were trying to achieve. So for me, it was about ensuring that our stakeholders were on this journey right from the beginning, with us right from the beginning. Whilst initially there was definitely some challenges because we were changing systems, there was new systems to learn, there was going to be new technologies. It was about bringing in the right resources to help them get through that to help our stakeholders better understand. So bringing in Salesforce educators, work building trail mixes in Trailhead, sending them on this educational path so they understood the platform and what it was gonna do, what this change was gonna mean for the organization and for them. So for me, it was about bringing them on this journey right from the beginning, taking them with us and making them feel like they're part of it because everyone loves to feel part of something. We all wanna feel, that's why we follow sports teams, we're part of it, we're in there. We want our team to win. And we wanted them to feel that as well. When we get a win, we're excited every day because we get wins every day with this project. My team love it because we're seeing great results. For them, we want them to be a part of it. So at our staff meetings, which happen monthly, we let them know results. We talk about where we're at. We let our new induction, all the new team members that join us once a month, we have an induction for team members across the group. And this vision is one of my slides. I read it out to them. I take them on this journey with us as if we were just starting. So for me, it really is about educating and keeping them on that journey with you. Robert started his journey as the champion for Salesforce and he is the champion, but it's probably at a level now where he's building a team of champions that are now executing. Something that we see in successful clients that adopt Salesforce is they have a very strong champion. They wear the Salesforce t-shirts, they live and breathe it, they make sure that there's passion around it and there's a marked difference. Like you have a company that doesn't have a champion assigned that cares about it, that is learning and passionate. And those companies really don't do well with Salesforce. You're force feeding it down everyone's throat. Whereas if you have someone like Robert internally, Robert is crucial for the wider adoption of the teams. He's the guy going around to the individual users and saying, hey, have you got some problems? Talk to me. And he turns that opinion, that negativity into a positive. That's the importance of the champion. You need to have an exec that cares and a champion that cares. And I think when you guys started out, Luke cared, the CEO, and you cared. And now you're owning the strategy at an executive level, and you're now building a team of champions that care. And these guys are like incredible humans that are working with. Oh, very much. Our team had to change. We had to grow with the system. It was me championing the thing the whole way through from the beginning. Came to the realization that, yep, we need more team members here because the system is big 
and we need to be able to get good ROI on it. So develop some key roles across the group, our digital integration analytics specialist, Liam, I work very closely with daily and he really is a champion for what we're doing. Catherine, who is our digital and CRM specialist, very much in the marketing cloud space, really kicking some strong engagement goals there. It was about getting these fellow advocates out there and helping our team members across the line as well with their challenges. For anyone that's playing the role of a champion in any organization, if you look at Robert, he's a really good role model for what a champion is. How do you be an awesome champion? It's about listening, understanding if there is objections to certain things, what are those objections? Are they real objections? Do we need to take them on? Should it pivot the way we're doing a particular project? Is that something we didn't actually see ourselves and it was good that this particular person brought it up? For me, there's a key word and that's conviction. If you, as the champion, as the advocate, as the leader of this project, don't have conviction in what you're doing, then nobody else will believe you. One thing I always do is try to speak with conviction. When I was presenting at Dreamforce, I presented with conviction because I had belief in what I was presenting in and the results that I was putting forward. So as a champion, you have to have conviction in what you're saying. And can you elaborate further on that? Conviction, how do you how do you mean conviction in, a, in this context? It's all about when you're talking about the journey, it's the why. Anyone can say, oh, we've integrated seven systems and we've brought it into one single source of truth. But only when you have true conviction for that project can you actually wholeheartedly talk about the why. Why did we actually do this in the beginning? Why have we continued to build on that and continue to build a robust system? So when you start talking with conviction in your tone, in your mannerisms, in your voice, in your context, you really start talking more about the why as opposed to the what. And the how. They need to know about how we connected them. They need to know why we've connected these systems, why we've gone on this journey. So you talk with conviction when you really start talking about the why. The champion needs to know the why. Why do we choose this system? What is the future going to look like? What is the benefit to the member at the end of the day that you're going to get from this implementation? Because it's hard to see that at the start, right? If you just started day one, it's hard to see where you'd be at now unless you'd had the vision or had seen it before in a different company. How did you know the why? I think for me, it was about going all in from the beginning. It, when Luke sat down with me and spoke about wanting to start looking at sort of digital transformation, I sort of, it became my life for a little while and I really put myself into it and did a lot of investigation and a lot of education as well in that initial phase to truly understand the capabilities and where the sort of digital transformation space was going. First party data became the center point of our whole project. And now it's on everybody's agenda because of this whole privacy changes, iOS, Google privacy. So, you know, we're leaps and bounds ahead of that because it was the core of what we were doing. And only through investigation back then did the data really stand out as the key to everything? It was about really getting in headfirst from the beginning and becoming immersed in it for that period so that at least the why became evident early on for me. The why for me really was we have members, we want them engaged, we want to feel relevant to them. We need to use first-party data to do that. So the why for us was members and our customer experience and using first-party data the whole way through. Career-wise, your career, had you not come across Salesforce or technology innovation, where would your career have naturally gone? D definitely the marketing communication space. When I was lucky back in the day when I was at university many moons ago, I made the call to do two degrees. I did a Bachelor of Business with a marketing major and a Bachelor of Computer Science. So I always had that techie and wearing glasses, mm. nerdy but feel. Yeah. So I always had that behind me, but if we didn't really kick off this journey and I was never introduced to this world of Salesforce or CRM land and the capabilities of marketing cloud, I would have more than likely stuck on that sort of CMO path. It's really interesting to see how this has transformed your career and now it's hopefully going to be a very rich tapestry of a future career for you, given this background. What keeps you up at night? I was asked this question over at Dreamforce on the stage, actually, and I think it's still the same thing. Uptime versus downtime. We rely heavily on all of our systems working all the time. Our integration, our middleware layer constantly working, our POS system constantly dropping files where it needs to, and our membership system working through its API. So I think for me, it's always waiting for that email to come from one of our team members at a reception desk at one of our venues saying you know, our membership forms aren't coming through or this isn't working. And we've worked to mitigate a lot of those. We were getting a fair few, probably twice a month, we were getting emails with small issues, but we learned from that and we've 
pivoted and changed some things. And really the last three months for us have been almost problem free. Once it becomes revenue dependent, that's when things change. How have you found that shift in terms of making sure that there's governance? Phase one, we were just all about the build. Let's build, let's get it built, let's get it going. Now we've had to take a step back and we've had to look at the day-to-day -day use of the system, the security of the system, ethical personalization is another key term that I've brought back with me from Dreamforce. And we're building our four pillars of ethical personalization now and into the new year because of the number of data breaches that go on. We're very lucky that we've partnered with Salesforce because trust is their first core value and they trust customers like us with our data and our customers, our members trust. And then when it comes to our team members as well, they want to feel secure in the system that they're using. And we've integrated with systems that have their own champions. You know, we have a champion of the POS system. We've made a decision to integrate POS, so we've had to keep that person abreast of what we're doing. Our member system, another department manage that, so we've got to integrate our membership system. So we have to also make sure that all of our stakeholders understand the security in place and how we're protecting data as well. From a marketing perspective, you can spam a lot of people and not use their data to personalize for them. If you use their data and really personalize for them in a way that helps them rather than hurts them. We're sort of building these four pillars and we're talking a lot about transparency. We've got a privacy policy and collection of data, all of that. We're gonna really be super transparent about it, how we collect the data, how it's secure, but also developing trust with our members around their consent for using their data. So when you join up as a member, you join up on, on a digital form now, which is great, and our privacy policy is there, and members understand how we're collecting their data. But then we wanna use that data to personalize their experience, because as you said, everybody hates being spammed. There's a 21 year old, male member want to hear that we've got bingo at 10 a.m. on Wednesday? Probably not. So we're going to use data ethically to make sure that message doesn't go to that member. Also about considering someone's intent on their behavior, not just their attributes. So whilst I might have said, does an 18 year old male or 21 year old male want to go to bingo at 10 a.m.? Probably not. Who knows? Maybe one does. And we have data on that because if you've used your card to buy your bingo book and you're 21, you'll fall into a bingo category and we'll let you know when bingo's on. You can't just rely on attributes or demographical data. You've also got to rely on behavioral. That's why this robust single source of truth for us is the key because we're bringing in behavioral data as well. If I had a concierge that knew everything about me, welcome back, Robin. How's your brother? How's your parents? How's your game the other day? He just knows everything about you. And your experience when you have that interaction is so much different than if it was just a blank, hi, I've never seen you before, but welcome anyway. With a platform like Salesforce, which is a customer engagement platform by nature, it allows you to scale that concierge experience where I really know you, I care about you, I have information on you. I think the ethical side is being like, we do this and this is how it works. And if you don't want us to do it, that's fine as you can opt out, but yeah. just be aware that we're trying to make it better for you. You've got to explain that as well. You've got to let people know. 75% of customers expect you to know what they want. For us, it's probably even higher because they're a member, yeah. not just going to buy a pair of jeans. They're a member of an organization. They're transacted to take up membership. So they mm. probably expect us to know even more about their likes and their dislikes. Uh, so yeah, I think it's just an integral part of any membership organization. What tangible results have you seen from your Salesforce investment? We're lucky because we saw almost instantly some great engagement results coming through. When we look at engagement, we've always spoken in marketing land around delivering the right message to the right customer at the right time through the right channel. And historically, as you touched on, we would send out a blast message to every member. Here's what's happening in November. Since we brought in Marketing Cloud, we've really worked on this hyper-personalized approach whereby there may be 20 messages in that email, but each member may on average see four of those messages based on intent, behavioral and demographical data as well and prior purchasing data. So since we've gone on that journey since August of 2020, we've seen email open rates grow from 21% to 60% and that's phenomenal, almost triple. That's great, but I don't rely heavily on open rates. I'm being, I'm more of a CTR, a click-through rate guy. That's where I see real engagement and our email click-through rates have jumped from 1.4% to 11.3%. So we've gone up roughly nine times click-through rates. And we're seeing that in venue as well because members are more engaged now than they've ever been. Our unsubscribe rates have gone from 1.4% to 0.4%. So a huge drop in unsubscribe rates because the content they're being delivered is more relevant than ever to. We're seeing huge results. We've seen results and we're, again, Project ROI is going to be a big one to really understand how this digital transformation has returned on its investment back to the business. But we've seen some quick wins. 
the marketing team across the group, we're saving about 20 hours a month now just on marketing through automation of communications and automation of reporting. So that's just a direct wage save right there. And we're getting more efficiencies out of those team members in other areas. And we're a community-based organization. So the more engaged our members are, the more burgers and schnitzels they buy, the more we can give back to community. That's at the core of everything we do. And our community mm. has grown around 13%. So this in turn is giving more back to our community. If you're looking at a digital transformation journey, don't be scared. Don't get overwhelmed. It's definitely a challenge. I think plan effectively, partner up effectively, take all of your stakeholders on that journey with you. And then when you've implemented, don't be afraid to use it. Don't be afraid to use this new shiny whiz bang tool because it's there to be used. It's there to help benefit the business. All the work, the blood, sweat and tears, the time and efforts that's gone into it, the system deserves to be used to its full capacity. So definitely get in there and start using it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Robert. Robert Lopez, he's the general manager of customer experience, brand and innovation at Norse Collective. He's also the president of the CMO Club Sydney chapter and an all-star Salesforce ranger. He's got over 1,500 badges on Trailhead, which is a huge number. I'm at 250, I think. So you're way ahead of me. Robert's very much a, a legend. He spoke at Dreamforce recently. I really appreciate having you on the show and your sage advice. How can people reach out to you, Robert, if they want to contact you? Yeah, look, I think LinkedIn is always the best way to do it. If you jump on LinkedIn and search out Robert Lopez, you'll probably see me there sitting and smiling. You can reach out to AF Digital, they can pass on my details, but definitely jump on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to have a chat and make a connection with anybody, wherever you are in the world. Let's connect. Awesome. Let's Let's connect. Great. Well, thank you, Robert. Great to have you on. Have a great day. Thanks, Robin. Thanks so much.